college football fans, black and gold fans, welcome in or welcome back to the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog, where we examine, discuss, celebrate, and honor all things college football across the entire college football landscape, but with a very special emphasis on our beloved black and gold squad of the University of Iowa Hawkeyes. On today's episode, guys, I get to take a look back and revisit how I fared in my uh, pre-kickoff 2022 college football season bold predictions. Can't wait to see how I did, and I can't wait to share that with you. Overall, I'm happy with it, but I'll let you be the judge of it. That's what's on tap for today's very special episode of the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. Welcome back, y'all. I am your usual host, Blair Parks. And yes, you just got a y'all out of me. Pardon me. I'm still a northerner, but maybe I'm losing my northern exposure here in the show me state of Missouri. But it's great to be back here with you guys. If you watched my last episode, my reaction and insight and opinion to the final AP Top 25 poll, I did mention how it's a great, wonderful time to be alive because right now we are in the midst of the NCAA Men's and Women's March Madness tournaments. The Sweet 16 is going on this weekend. Can't wait to watch that. And what does that also mean? Yes, not only is opening day of baseball, that'll be upon us very soon, Will also will be the tradition unlike none other, the Masters Tournament down in Augusta, Georgia. But also that means that spring football is now underway across the entire nation at a university or campus near you. So we're getting really close, guys, to kickoff of the college football season 2023. Can't wait for that. And before I say anything more, Thank you guys. If you like what you see or what you hear today on the Touchdown Black and Gold vlog, please subscribe, like, share, comment. I always encourage your involvement. I've said this several times, and if you've watched me before, it is true. I would not lie to you, the Black and Gold family, and all of you college football fans alike, that you the viewer, the fan, you are the one who drives these episodes. So please, let your voice be heard. Comment. Let me know what you think about what I state or what you see or hear during this episode, whether you agree, disagree, if you want to enlighten me, because I never claim to be, a, you know, a professional or the best at this. So I'd love to hear from you. Give me your opinion. Let me know if, if I've forgotten something or maybe, hey, add this if you could. I want to hear from you, all of you college football fanatics across the entire nation. So please get involved and subscribe. I want to hear from you. And if you do, I promise you that sooner than later, I will get back to each and every one of you individually and answer your comments and concerns from this episode. And for, like I said, you don't have to be a fan of the Iowa Hawkeyes to enjoy the Touchdown Black and Gold vlog. This is for all college football fans alike. This is a safe haven, a welcome spot, a place of nirvana and harmony. Ah. And Zen, this is where you need to be. And if you've been looking for a channel that basically is looking, that sounds like this is what you've been looking for, then I say to you, welcome home. So let's continue to grow. I need your help. Please subscribe so we can find more college football fans just like you. My goal is before week zero kickoff, which we have plenty of time for that. As of today, it is March 22nd. I would like to have 200 subscribers here in the Touchdown Black and Go vlog. I think we can do it but we need to do it together. So thank you for all you've done and everything you will continue to do for the channel. And like I stated, this is one of my favorite episodes, guys. Coming up will be my third season of doing the Touchdown Black and Gold vlog. And every year, my favorite episode is 
my preseason bold predictions episode. Usually I will get that out a couple months before the Labor Day holiday weekend, which to me is all about college football kickoff weekend. I love doing this and I love to revisit and look back and see how I fared. Now, I really needed to, the pressure's on here, you know, yours truly here is sweating a little bit because I know I may have lost a little bit of legitimacy and some credibility with some of you because yes, unfortunately, this guy right here did pick TCU to shock the dogs and to shock the college football world. Somehow I picked them that I thought they would win the national championship game, even though I did state in that episode that Georgia hands down is the better team. I just thought potentially that TCU was one of those teams of destiny, so to speak. So I'm going to try to get back on your good side because a lot of these bold predictions that I made, very few other so-called experts and pundits made these uh, bold predictions. I did, and I definitely did direct hit on a lot of these. So when I go through these guys, I will be telling you how I scored. I think overall I had, I believe, 27 of these. Yep, 27 bold predictions. And they're going to be worth up to a maximum of one point. They could be one full point, a half a point, or zero points. So let's say, uh, for example, my coaching hirings and firings. If I listed five and I got three or four out of the five correct, that's going to be worth half a point. Now, let's say, obviously, if I get all five right, that's going to be a full point, all right? So that's how I went back and graded myself, and I'll be more than happy to share my final grade with you at the very end. So please, subscribe, comment, like, share, rate, get involved, let me know how I'm doing. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get right into it. So my very first bold prediction that I made prior to the 2022 college football kickoff was, I believed that zero, and I stated this on record in a previous episode, that prior to conference championship weekend, there would be zero remaining undefeated teams in college football. Absolutely, that ended up being a miss, but not by much. I mean, when it came down to it, there was only three. We had Georgia, Michigan, and TCU. So unfortunately, guys, my first one that I gave you is worth a big donut. In other words, I do have, I could tell you this right now, it's going to be an absolute miss. <gasps> and nothing. So unfortunately, it wasn't the way I wanted to start off, but that's how it is sometimes. My second bold prediction that I shared with you, the Touchdown Black and Gold vlog family, I said, the college football playoff field will be very familiar, basically status quo, from CFP fields we have seen in years previous. And guess what, guys? This is an absolute direct hit because this guy did come to fruition. Boom! Direct hit on this one. Because uh, previously, two years ago, we had not one, but two teams that were first-timers, first-time participants in the college football playoff. It was both the Michigan Wolverines and the Cincinnati Bearcats. This year, we had one new addition, a first-timer, but the other three were teams that we have seen before. And even though this this movie seems to play out the same. We've seen it time and time again. We still love this sport, and we're still going to pay attention and watch it. That's why I cannot wait for the expanded 12-team college football playoff to begin, because you're going to have a lot more variety. It won't be so watered down, so vanilla. So normally, you're only going to have seven to eight teams that basically are going to have a shot currently to make the current uh, college football playoff setup of four teams. Because this year, just to review, the four college football playoff contenders we have this past season were the Georgia Bulldogs, who have made multiple before that, 
the Ohio State Buckeyes, a normal participant in the playoff. Michigan, the Wolverines, went back-to-back years, and our new participant was the TCU Horned Frog. So that one was worth one point. Number three. This was a bold one, guys, and I was so high on one team from this conference that's why uh, two of my bold predictions kind of go hand in hand. So the first part of this is, I told you, I predicted that the Pac-12 would make a return and be represented in the college football playoff field. That did not happen. I just gave you the four participants in the previous bold prediction I made. So number three is a direct miss. Nothing on this one. Because I did pick one team to make the college football playoff field last year from the uh, Pac-12 conference. And I'll get to that here in a little bit. So number four, this was a big one. I said that the SEC title game will act as either an elimination game or a play-in game for the college football playoff field. This one, depending on how you look at it, but when I had to go back and subjectively and objectively grade these, this one is also a miss. So right now, I'm not doing great, guys. I'm kind of struggling. I mean, I wish I could be doing a little bit better. Yep, there's the cannon with, you know, there's no response, no, no luck there. Because this year's SEC title game, because it wasn't, it was neither an ELIM or a playing game. If you recall, undefeated Georgia, who went into the SEC title game ranked number one, well-deserved, by the way, they faced off with LSU, who I believe was also ranked in the top 10. But LSU came into that game with three losses, guys. So let's say Georgia would have lost. Because of how dominant they were, they would have received an absolute... Uh, a spot in the playoff field as an at-large, they still would have made the college football playoff. And let's say LSU would have shocked the Georgia Bulldogs in the SEC title game. Hate to tell you this, uh, Tiger fans, you know, I, I love you, but even if you would have beaten Georgia, you would not have gotten an invite to the college football playoff. You would not have. I mean, two of your three losses weren't bad. I mean, you lost by one point to Florida State, very solid team last year. You got absolutely dominated at home by Tennessee, but your third loss in the regular season, you can't lose to Texas A&M and expect to get into the college football playoff. You just can't. And that's one of those things that I mentioned during my last episode was I'm sick and tired of having good wins count so much more than awful losses. That loss by LSU to A&M, that's an awful loss. It basically cancels out their good, great win over Alabama. At that point, they cancel each other out, so you can't say that win over Alabama was so much better than the loss to A&M. You can't say that. They have to, they have to count equally. So the SC title game was not either an ELIM or a play-in game. Number five. This is the one you've been waiting for. I brought it up a little bit ago. Now, the college football playoff field that I projected uh, prior to the 2022 college football season, these were my four participants. I picked Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, and Utah. Now, Utah was the Pac-12 team that I uh, did pick to reach the college football playoff field. And of the four that I predicted, guys, only one made it. So this is an absolute miss. I only got Ohio State, the Buckeyes, correct. So didn't do very good on that one. I'll try to do a little bit better this upcoming season. Number six dealt with my Heisman Trophy finalists. All right. Now, this to me, this is one to where your boy here can get a little bit of legitimacy back. Because I did very well with this one. Now, the four Heisman Trophy finalists that I predicted prior to last season's kickoff, I said they would be Will Anderson Jr., a linebacker from Alabama, Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud, 
USC quarterback Caleb Williams. And the surprising one, even though he didn't make it, but if he just would have stayed healthy, he would have absolutely been there. I don't care what you all say or think, but most of you college football fans, I think you're going to agree with me. I also told you the ultimate sleeper who would end up in NYC would have been Tennessee quarterback Hendon Hooker. But once he got hurt late in the season, just didn't come to fruition. But up until the point of that time, after their big walk-off win over Alabama guys, I mean, Hendon Hooker basically was a shoe-in for the Heisman Trophy and probably was the Heisman Trophy front-runner at that point. So when it came down to it, I got uh, three. Uh, nope, I got two out of the four right. But I'm going to give myself some credit because Hendon Hooker would have been there barring that injury once again. So I did give myself one point on this one. That's right, you may agree or disagree on that one, but because of Hendon Hooker, I'm gonna go and give myself a direct boom hit on this one. So there's one point here for your boy, so I'm back on track. Now going with that, number seven, the Heisman Trophy winner. I predicted preseason. During that episode, prior to 2022, that quarterback, USC quarter, that uh, I said quarterback from Ohio State, C.J. Stroud, would be the Heisman Trophy winner. That did not happen. It went to USC quarterback, uh, Caleb Williams, even though I think, guys, in the college football playoff semifinal between Ohio State and Georgia, I think C.J. Stroud showed us why and that he is the best player in college football. He just was, I think, last season. So number seven was a miss as well. Now, number eight, I'll tell you right now, this one, not a direct hit, guys, but this is a hit. I gave myself a half a point for this one. If you recall, I said this. I said these three first-year head coaches at their new programs would either lead their teams to the uh, conference championship games, or they would win their conference championship games in their first year. I said that it would be Oregon, first year uh, Oregon head coach Dan Lanning, first year Oklahoma coach Brent Venables, and first year coach at TCU, Sonny Dykes. Obviously, didn't happen for Oregon or for Oklahoma, but absolutely, I Absolutely nailed TCU under the uh, the tutelage of Sonny Dykes, Coach Sonny Dykes, to get to the Big 12 title game. That happened, and then some. They did lose that title game to Kansas State, but still made the college football playoff field with one loss. So that's why I gave myself a half a point on this one, guys. So not a direct hit, but still a hit. Number nine. And this is what I stated Prior to the kickoff, now this is one I want to get your comments on, guys, because this one, I really like to know what you, the college football fan, thinks about this uh, prediction that I made. I said, prior to last season's kickoff, the best player at the non-Power 5 level and at the non-Power 5 ranks would be Fresno State quarterback Jake Hayner. I gave myself, guys, a direct hit on this. There were a couple other potentials that you could say, hey, that person was the best player at the uh, non-Power 5 uh, level. But I chose Jake Hayner because I know he did miss a few games during the season because of an injury. But these are the numbers that Jake Hayner posted for the Fresno State Bulldogs. He threw for 2,896 yards, 20 touchdowns to three interceptions. That's it. In only nine and a half games, he went down um, early in the first half, I believe week three against the uh, against USC. So in nine and a half games, he threw for those numbers. Pretty impressive. Also coming back, he led Fresno State to the Mountain West West Division Championship. And then they went on and defeated Boise State in the Mountain West Championship game. So they were the Mountain West champions behind the arm of Jake Hayner. And then they also went out there and beat a Power 5 opponent in Washington State in their bowl game. 
So that's why I'm giving myself a direct hit on this one. Jay Kaner was the best player at the non-Power 5 uh, level last year. Let me know what you think about that one, guys. Number 10. This is a big one. And this is, I brought this to your attention because I think this is something a lot of you didn't know anything about. I told you that by season's end, uh, before last year's kickoff, that the NCAA college football record book will be rewritten by a unknown player. And that did happen. I told you that Troy linebacker Carlton Marshall coming into the season, he only need a, he needed 104 tackles to then become the career tackles leader all time in college football. Uh, Carlton did record the, uh, the needed 104 and then some. So congratulations, Carlton Marshall. You are now in the record books. You rewrote it. So I wanted to make all of you aware of this. And because of his accomplishments, I'm going to go ahead and give myself another direct boom hit on that one. Well done, Carlton. So there's one point for the good guys. Number 11. I told you prior to last season that the that the following that these following non-power five teams would be the sleepers. Teams that, hey, if your favorite team is matching up with these uh, teams on the gridiron, you better look out. Or if you end up playing them in a bowl game, do not sleep on them, do not take them lightly. And here were the teams that I stated prior to last season's kickoff. I said those teams would be UCF, Appalachian State, Boise State, Fresno State, Air Force, Northern Illinois University, and Houston. Now, some of them did come to fruition. Some did not. Um, Appalachian State, we know what they did, how they shocked the college football playoff world early in the season, going to College Station and knocking off the cheat. Oh, I'm sorry. That great gentleman, the head coach of Texas A&M, Jimbo Fisher, in the Aggies. So we know what they did. Boise State and Fresno State, I just told you right there, both of them won their divisions in the Mountain West Conference with Fresno State winning. Air Force won 10 games. I mean, they had an excellent year in the bowl game. The Falcons knocked off uh, Power 5 and the defending Big 12 champion Baylor Bears from the uh, Big 12. So Air Force had a great season. NIU, the Huskies, the defending MAC champions, they fell a little flat, a little short of expectations, as did Houston. But UCF had a great season, again, under the Gus Bus, Gus Malzahn. So for this one, guys, I gave myself one point for a direct hit. Number 12. I told you that the winner of the Mountain West Championship game, which, and which I predicted would be Fresno State versus Air Force, I said the winner of that game would have would earn an advance. They would have uh, earned the New Year's Six Bowl invite, which goes to the highest ranked non-Power 5 opponent. This one, unfortunately, was a miss. I got Fresno State right, but not Air Force. They came up one game short, and the New Year's Six Bowl berth ended up going to Tulane, the American Athletic Ch uh, Championship Conference Championship winner. And in the Cotton Bowl, I believe is what it was, they did stun and knock off the men of Troy and Caleb Williams, the Heisman Trophy winner, and the Trojans. So it all worked out beautifully when it comes down to the non-Power 5 level. So that's a miss on that one as well. Number 13, this is one that was a little bit near and dear to my heart, being a Hawkeye fan. I told you, prior to last season, the two deepest and most competitive divisions in all of college football were going to be the ACC Atlantic Division and the Big Ten West Division. And when I look back on this one, this is not a direct hit, but it's still a hit. So I gave myself a half a point on this one. The uh, ACC Atlantic, I did pick Clemson to win. They were one of my college football playoff uh, uh, participants who I projected would get there. They won the Atlantic, but they ended up winning by three games. I thought it would maybe be a one-game race, maybe two, amongst Clemson, 
NC State, uh, Wake Forest, Florida State. But winning by three games, they really kind of uh, put the rest of, of the competition in their rearview mirror. Now, the Big Ten West, guys, this is why I gave myself half a point. Absolutely. I mean, uber competitive. It didn't, you couldn't even tell. I mean, this race came down to the final weekend of the season, guys. All Iowa had to do, unfortunately, was uh, defeat Nebraska on Black Friday at home. They did not do that. A game that I was with my brother and my young son. Fortunately, it didn't happen. Then Purdue, when they beat Indiana on that next day on Saturday, the final regular season weekend of the year, they are the ones who advanced to Indianapolis and claimed the Big Ten West division. So absolutely, that was a hit worth half, half a point there on that one. Number 14, this one was a miss, but I would have really liked to know what would have happened if things would have just been a little bit different, maybe different circumstances. I told you prior to last season that NC State, the oh, the Wolfpack, would ultimately finish in the in the uh, top ten in the final AP Top Twenty Five poll for the first time in their program history. They did not do that. Overall, NC State finished eight and five on the season, but I think a lot of that came down to the um, season-ending injury of their stud quarterback Devin Leary, who has now since transferred to Kentucky. So I just would have liked to see Devin Leary out there the entire season. Maybe they would have pushed Clemson a little bit more or maybe still finished maybe 9-3, and 10-2. Maybe still would have been in that top 10. But I guess we'll never know. So that was a miss on that one. Number 16. <laughs> this is one that really got blown up very early on. I'm talking even in week zero, to be uh, truthful with you guys. Based on how things were trending in the last couple of seasons prior to last season, I went out on a limb, guys, and I said that the following three teams would go winless in their uh, during their conference play. I said that Duke, Northwestern, and Vanderbilt will, would all go winless within their conference play. And guess what? They all won. So this is great news for three, these three teams. I'm going to start off with Duke. Duke went 9-4. and four. I mean, what a great first year under first-year coach Mike Elko. What a great job he's done uh, there with Duke. Um, Vanderbilt, that's right. Vanderbilt went five and seven. They notched not just one, but two conference victories last year. At the very end of the year, they won at Kentucky and knocked off Florida there in Nashville. So great job, Vanderbilt. Definitely are getting a little bit better, improving under Coach Clark Lee. And Northwestern, guys, here's the thing. Northwestern's a team that played in week zero they kicked off in Old Ireland against Nebraska, a Big Ten conference game right out of the chute. They were able to knock off Nebraska. And Northwestern's final record for the season, guys, 1-11. and 11. So, fortunately, I missed all three of these. So this is one of those guys that I can't even give myself half credit for. So this is a... Let's see. And... Nothing. Big time miss on this guy. All right. Number 17. And this is one that I took a chance on this, but I did believe it based on uh, the matchup of between rosters, where it was played at, and when played. Because a lot of the times when we see upsets happen, it really is dependent on how does it shake up in the schedule? A team coming off a big victory, a big loss at home, on the road. And that's why I predicted this. I said prior to last season that both Georgia and Alabama would lose at least one conference game during the regular season. And I went even further to say Georgia was going to lose at Mississippi State with the power of the cowbell. 
And I said that Alabama would lose at Tennessee on Old Rocky Top. This one ended up being half credit, so a hit, not a direct hit, because Alabama did lose to Tennessee. So I just, that one was not a surprise to me. I saw that, and you guys know how high I was on Hendon Hooker. So half a credit on this one. So not bad, though. I mean, I took a chance. I'm definitely going to pick a couple of those big upset games. Again, coming up in my bold predictions for the 2023 season, which will be upon, upon you and released here in a few months. Number 18. Oof, this one was a miss. But not as... Not as far off or bad as I first thought until I went back and looked at both of these two teams. I told you that at season's end, I predicted that BYU, BY who? BYU, the Cougars, would be the best FBS independent team in the nation. Obviously, it was a miss. BYU ended the season 8-5, and five, and they lost. They lost to fellow FBS independent powerhouse Notre Dame. These two teams squared off in Las Vegas. Notre Dame finished with a 9-4 record. So it's not like Notre Dame was so much better than BYU. Both teams had some pretty head-scratching uh, head losses, especially Notre Dame losing to Marshall and Stanford, both at home. I mean, just bad losses. But since Notre Dame did beat BYU straight up, and I believe BYU lost to East Carolina, had some other bad losses, I got to go with a miss on this one. Sorry, BYU. And I'm so excited to see BYU in the Big 12 Conference this upcoming season. Can't wait. I am super excited and stoked for that one. So that was a miss for number 18. Number 19. This is a big one. Now, we know two seasons ago, well, I should say two off-seasons ago, we saw a coaching carousel unlike anything we had ever seen, guys. All of these cats leaving legitimate power programs for others. We will probably never see that kind of action ever again. But what I did, I still predicted that the following coaches would be dismissed either during the season or at season's end. And here, here's the ones that I stated to you prior to last season's kickoff. I said that Herm Edwards would be out at Arizona State. Carl Durrell would be axed at Colorado. I told you Jeff Collins would be out at Georgia Tech. And I said Dino Babers would be out at Syracuse. So when I look at this one, I'm going to give myself a direct hit because I got three out of the four correct. Herm Edwards, gone. Carl Durrell, gone. Income coach, prime time. At Colorado, Deion Sanders. Jeff Collins is out at Georgia Tech. Dino Babers is still safe. I think he will be on the hot seat again this season, but the Syracuse Orange were really a very good surprise, good story during last year's college football season. A couple of big wins for the Qs up there in New York, so Dino Babers is safe for now. So I gave myself a direct hit, one point on this one. So can I go ahead and get a direct hit, please, maestro? Boom. <laughs> now you're probably wondering, uh, Blair, there's a couple of big names there I didn't hear on the coaching carousel, the firing and hiring uh, front. You're right, because I made two additional predictions separately for the following two coaches and had mixed results. The first one, that's right, I did not forget about old Scott Frost there at Nebraska. This is what I predicted. I predicted even though he was on the hottest of all hot seats, I thought that since Nebraska didn't remove him at the, uh, at, uh, the previous year's end, that they just weren't going to remove him. That's right. I told you guys prior to last season's kickoff that Scott Frost at season's end will remain the head coach at Nebraska. This is a miss after a uh, one and two uh, record, uh, two early losses in the season. 
Scott Frost was dismissed by Nebraska. Um, that second loss, that first loss I mentioned came over in Ireland across the pond against Northwestern, and then a loss at home against Georgia Southern from the Sun Belt Conference. That was really the final nail in the coffin. I think if he loses one of those games, or I guess wins one of those games, I think he still would have been there until the very end of the season. But when he lost to both Georgia Southern and Northwestern, that was it. So I thought that team would win enough games to keep him there. Over under Vegas had them pegged at seven and a half victories. I told you all to take the under. I thought they could have gotten to six, maybe seven wins. And I think that would have been enough to keep Scott Frosty on the sideline, but didn't happen. So that was a miss. Number 21. Auburn, that's right, the Auburn, the dumpster fire that is Auburn football right now. We'll see if they have it fixed. Uh, uh, in battle coach Brian Harson, who I think they tried every way possible to dismiss him during last year's offseason, but he was brought back. I told you preseason that Auburn would dismiss coach Brian Harson during the season. And that absolutely happened, so that is a direct hit. Um, I believe after a 3-5 and five record following a loss to Arkansas, that's when they pulled the plug on Coach Harson down there on the Plains at Auburn. So that's a direct hit for uh, yours truly. Number 22, kind of piggyback off of uh, Brian Harson and Auburn. I also told you, I said that Hugh Freeze, that's right, will be named the next head football coach at Auburn. Absolutely has come to fruition. It's happened. So that's another direct hit for yours truly right here. So can I go ahead and get a direct hit on those? Boom, there it is. So there's two points for the good guys. Now for all you betters out there, and I have had great success as Barat would say, over my last two seasons doing my over-under best bet win totals here on the Touchdown Black and Gold vlog. In a few months, I will give you my winners for this season because I have not lost one team yet. And if you've listened to me and you've put some money down, your wallets have gotten a little fatter, Johnny Manziel style. So this is what I told you guys. I said uh, prior to the season that these are my best bet win totals I said to take the over on TCU, Oregon State, Missouri, Tennessee, and Stanford. And I told you to take the under on Kentucky and Nebraska. This is an absolute direct hit. Now, Stanford did not actually go the over. They were pegged at, I think, three and a half or maybe four victories but early on, when I first made these bowl predictions, Vegas had them tabbed at three wins, which, hey, they get to three, that's a push, you get your money back. But when it came time for me to lay my money down, I believe it had gone up to four games, and I couldn't take the Stanford Cardinals, so I didn't. So everybody else, I bet, and I made some money. So you need to listen to this guy right here. So that is one point for me right there on my best bet win totals. Number 24, this is something that I consider myself very good at seeing from a roster perspective and a scheduling perspective. Uh, how many games can you win? When can you win them? When are your losses going to take place? And that really affects the ranking process, whether it's AP, coaches, or college football playoff. So these, these following teams, I told you, I just don't think they're going to be as published, as hyped. I think that they're going to come up a little bit short. So I said that the following teams would begin the season ranked, but would end the season unranked in the final AP poll. Those teams I predicted were the Arkansas Razorbacks, the Baylor Bears, the Cincinnati Bearcats, the Iowa Hawkeyes, the Pitt Panthers, Kentucky Wildcats, and the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Love that mascot, by the way. And guess what? All of them did not finish ranked. So there you go. I got this one right. 
None of them finished the season ranked. And once again, I made these predictions before the first official AP poll came out. All of them were ranked, um, except for one, our Iowa Hawkeyes did not crack the initial AP Top 25 poll. So that's another direct hit for your boy here. So near the end of my projections and my uh, bowl predictions, I ended up doing pretty well. I definitely have started, I kind of ended on a little hot streak there. So here we go. Uh, and that should be another direct hit there. There we go. Thank you there, uh, Maestro. All right, number 25. And this is one, guys, that's still kind of TBD, to be determined. So I'm going to tell you right now, it's not, it's neither right nor wrong. I definitely am going to find out very soon because either it's going to happen or it's not. So until that time, I gave myself a half a point. I just counted this as a hit. A very, very bold and big time statement that I mentioned last year. I said, because of all of the upheaval right now, Throughout the college football landscape, how everything has changed so much due to conference realignment, NIL, the transfer portal. I mean, it is a constantly flowing, ever-changing dynamic and world. I said that there had to be something or somebody or someone to keep everything in check, to keep this foundation from cracking. So this is what I predicted. I predicted that prior to the 2023 college football season, so I still got some time for this one to come true, I predicted that Barry Alvarez, that's right, former Wisconsin coach and AD up there of the Badgers, will be named the inaugural college football commissioner, or czar, whatever you want to call him, because I think eventually college football is going to get a commissioner or a president somebody that's going to just keep the chaos controlled and organized chaos. And I can't think of anybody better, better suited, more experienced than Barry Alvarez. If you have somebody in mind who would be a good college football commissioner, please comment below that. Let me know what you think. Number 26. I've only got two more for you guys. We're getting ready to wrap up this episode here. Thank you once again for your time and attention everything you do, please subscribe, comment, like, share, rate. Let me know what you think. Number 26. This is one that I'm very proud of, guys. Yes, I know I picked them to win the title game. I've already, you know, thrown myself on the mat, on the floor, you know, at your mercy. I know I screwed up. I listened to my heart and not my head on this one that I told you, though, and I'm proud of this one. I said prior to last season's kickoff, I said TCU and first-year head coach Sonny Dykes will advance to the Big 12 Conference Championship game, which they did. I did not pick them to win uh, said Conference Championship game or get to the college football playoff, but we know that is what happened. So this is an absolute direct hit on this one. Because I was very, very high on the TCU Horned Frogs last year. I was. And with good reason. Good roster. Good schedule. So I was not surprised by their overall success. I wasn't. My last one, guys. Number 27. Another one that's very dear, near and dear to my heart, being a Big Ten man. And, you know, you guys know, if you've watched past episodes... You know, my two biggest man crushes in all of college football have got to be uh, Coach P.J. Fleck, the bald-headed beauty up there at Minnesota, and number two, now kind of a lot of separation because he's really lost a lot of points for me. I'm all about Coach Patty Fitzgerald up there at Northwestern and what everything he's done for the Wildcat program there in Evanston. But this one, you know, things really are continuing to not bode and go well for the Northwestern Wildcat program, especially under Coach uh, Pat Fitzgerald. So this is what I predicted. And remember, I also predicted Northwestern was going to go winless during Big Ten Conference play. I predicted before last year's kickoff that following a winless conference campaign at season's end, 
Northwestern head football coach Pat Fitzgerald would voluntarily resign his position as head coach. That did not happen. He is still there. But I definitely think coming into this season, he is on the hot seat. And I hate to say that, guys, because Coach Fitzgerald, really, uh, he's everything Northwestern football, both as a player and a coach. Everything that has been positive when it, when it comes down to that football program, he is directly involved. Like I said, either as a player or as a coach on the sideline. So that's it, guys. That's all of my bold predictions revisited. As far as my overall final score, out of a possible 27 points, I scored 13.5, so 13 and a half points, which is good for exactly 50% correct. I'll take it. Saying 50-50 isn't bad. I'd rather be more like 70-30. But hey, overall, 50% of my bold predictions came uh, true. So I'm happy with that. All I can do is hopefully can do better during, for the upcoming 2023 college football season. So that's it, guys. Thanks very much for joining me on this episode of the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. Please let me know what you think. Comment, subscribe, like, share, rate, get involved. Can't wait to hear from you. Um, next week, definitely something that I've got to... I need to address the elephant in the room. The Iowa offense, or lack thereof, and the nepotism. What the hell is going on in Iowa City right now with our offense? More specifically, the offensive coordinator, Brian Ferentz. Now that this, uh, a few weeks back, it broke what his new restructured contract is, what the expectations are for the Iowa offense for the upcoming season. An Iowa offense which, you know, ended up ranking 130th out of 131 total for offense. We need to maybe unpack this a little bit. I need to finally address this, get it out there, and I need to hear your, uh, your voices to, for that episode. So we'll see. Will Iowa continue to be the laughing stock of college football offensively for this season? We'll have to wait and see. But thanks, guys. I appreciate everything you do for the channel. Danke. Thank you. Gracias. Merci beaucoup. Oregato. And all those thank yous. So until next week, guys, enjoy your week and your weekend. Big shout out. You know, best of luck to the number two seeded Iowa Hawkeye women's basketball team. And Caitlin Clark should absolutely be the player of the year this year in college football or college football. Wow. Woo! In women's uh, college basketball. And quite frankly, guys, if you haven't seen her play, she might be the best college basketball player, period. Women or men in the nation. Just saying. Can she get both? Could she legally and really get both the women's and men's? Eh, possibly. Time will tell. But guys, I'll see you next week. Thank you again. Go black and gold. See you then. Bye-bye.